in here. And um, would you all uh, mute your mics right now, please? Everyone mute your microphone. Um, today is March 2nd. This um, is the first day, the first Bible study in, this, um, in March. We are on our ninth um, episode in season two. We have a special guest today, and uh, but we're going to open right now with a word of prayer and um, thank God for this time together. Bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Lord, we thank you for um, this time that we have together to learn about you. God, we pray that you would be blessed and that everyone uh, on this on this call would uh, feel your blessings, oh Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, today um, our guest is um, Ray Ortland, and Ray is the uh, Pastor of Emmanuel Church in Nashville, where JP and I have had the pleasure of visiting, and that um, his wife Janie at their church. And um, Ray, he uh, received his. He went to Wheaton College. I didn't know that. That's one of our partner schools uh, for undergraduate. He went to Dallas Theological Seminary for his MD, UC Berkeley for his master's, and he went to Scotland at the University of Aberdeen to get his PhD. He was ordained at Lake Avenue Church, Congregational Church in 1975 in Pasadena, and that's where um, our families um, met each other. Um, he's also taught Old Testament and Semitic languages at Trinity College, but mainly for the last 28 years, he has been a pastor um, in California, um, Oregon, Georgia, and Tennessee now. He's published eight books. Uh, please mute your mic, please. Um, and he's written eight books, and uh, he has helped to translate several versions of the Bible, including the New Living Testament, the English Standard Version of the Bible, and the ESV Study Bible. He's the president of Renewal Ministries and serves on the Council of the Gospel Coalition. He and his wife, Janie, have been married for 45 years. They have four children, 13 grandchildren. Um, one of his, this book um, titled The Gospel was, um, um, his book in, in 2017's book, Marriage and the Mystery of the Gospel was named Christian Book of the Year. These are a couple of his books. We encourage you to go and um, get them on Amazon or anywhere you can get, or any Christian bookstore. And coming out in, um, at the end of this year in September, he has a book entitled The Death of Porn, Men of Integrity. Um, and I can't read that, let's see. Men of Integrity, Building a World of Nobility. I think that's uh, something that we definitely need this, this today. And so Ray, we wanna welcome you and thank you so much for being with us today. Um, are you, can you have your mic on? I do, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. And Good. so. We'd love for you to just give us a, um, well, JP, you have any comment first? Well, I, I got some comments first, yes, okay. here. Uh, this is a day that we're asking the question related to the crisis of our hour. Hmm. Ben, Dr. Banner Art and I are asking a better yet asking this question among our students. You, you are the reason for our existence. You are the focus of our affection. The people we are teaching them to be salt and light in the world. And we are asking the crisis questions of our day. What is the mission of the church? What is the church? We are confused. We are confused. God is doing what he did in the beginning of the church. He's calling out from among the nations, the nationalities. God formed nations. 
He's called them out from among those. They called them the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews turned God's one people into two. He wanted them to be one. He wanted us to be a special nation. He wanted us to be a, a raw priesthood. He wanted us to become a special nation. We fought that. And the flood came. Because our imagination went wrong. The imagination of our heart. God said this every time we get into confusion. The imagination of our heart become uh, thinking about themselves all the time. They become vain in their imagination. And their foolish heart was dark. They perpetually lied. They became fools and changed the glory of incorruptible God into a dictator image before God gave them up and let them go in their own way. Then he decided to fix it. He would come himself. God himself would come and show us it could be fixed by law. What, what, so we asked the question, what is this fixer? What is, how is he fixing it? He's fixing it through the church. He's fixing it by the people. When they recognize him, he reconciles them to himself. And they become his ambassadors here on earth. What is the church? The church is calling out. James said this. People from this broken world to bear his name. And they is his body. He indwells them through the Holy Spirit to make us his ambassadors. So we ask him, what is his mission now? His mission now is the mission that has always been. And that mission is to reconcile people to God by his loving grace. And that's what this Bible class here to do. And so we are so uh, delighted. Vanna Art and I is so delighted to have Ray Orton, my father's, his father's became my friend and loved me, and I adopted Ray. <laughs> so we are adopted into the family of God. But you there, folks, this is for you. This is this is for you. You are the focus of our affection. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to help us to walk in truth. Because if we walk in truth, we are walking in the light. If we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we can really have friendship reconciliation one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, will keep on Is washing it, it come in, huh? So, yeah. tell us, I will Ray, Dr. He, Bernard he, first. But he's going he's gonna to get some. But first, we want to hear from Ray. Uh, just to um, give a little background on your life, your testimony, how you came to the Lord, and then how you became this brilliant master teacher, pastor of pastors. So <laughs> uh, give us uh, your testimony and, and just let us get to know you. Okay, glad to. Uh, by the way, this is such, this is a sacred privilege for me to be with you in this way with Dr. Perkins and everyone there. And I'm deeply, deeply grateful. Uh, there's not much to say about me, but I was born into a Christian family and I was reborn in that Christian family. One morning when I was six years old, we were sitting at the breakfast table. My mom was uh, at one end of the table to my right. My dad was to my left, my two sisters on the other side of the table. And I forget how it played out, but my dad explained the gospel to me at the breakfast table. 
And I knew already intuitively there was something wrong with me because I had stolen something at school. And something inside me said, that's wrong. And so when G dad explained that Jesus came to die on the cross for my sins, I was only six years old and that made sense to me. And so he asked me if, if I wanted to pray a prayer to receive Christ as my savior. And I bowed my little six-year-old head and I prayed that prayer. Maybe it sounds crazy, but I actually felt within me, myself this weight of an almost physical weight being lifted off of me. I think our children are, are very capable of being taught by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus became real to me. My dad was the greatest man I've ever known. Uh, he put the Lord first in everything, in it, but he did it in a cheerful way, in an attractive way that I really respected. When I was 19, I met an absolutely gorgeous and absolutely godly woman and fell crazy in love. And um, we've been, been married all these years. In fact, this December, uh, we will have been married 50 years. Uh, we have four children, and I can't even keep track of my grandchildren anymore. <laughs> Jenny has to remind me how many we have. We have one grandchild in heaven, and I look forward to meeting her there. I've been a pastor for 45 years. I love what I do. I believe the Bible and try to take it straight. I love the Lord, and I'm trying to pay attention to him. I realize now that I am playing the fourth quarter of my game. And by God's grace for his glory, he has me in the red zone. And by his grace for his glory, uh, he, he wants to score that touchdown through me, um, which means for me, walking with him every day, yielding my life to him. It, it has to be simple, friends, or else it can't work for me. So it's simply walking with the Lord, saying yes to him moment by moment, loving my wife and family, telling the truth gently, boldly, cheerfully, and investing in the rising generation, as Dr. Perkins was just saying a moment ago. Nothing else matters to me. I, here, here's, what's, here's the great thing about being an older man. The ones who really matter now are, it's not me anymore. It's the rising generation. They're the ones who matter. It's so freeing. So that's me. And um, I'm profoundly grateful for this privilege of serving the Lord with all of okay. you right now. Thank you so much, Ray. And we have been doing a study on uh, the church. Uh, this is our second week today. Um, Ray is going to continue in that, but before we start, we'd love for Dr. Vander Ark, if you would just recap uh, what we have been studying, bring us up to date for those who were not here last year, last week. Well, I am delighted uh, to address this group of people who love the Lord. We have been studying the church and what it means to be part of the church. So we had an introduction, introductory session last week on the church. And in the coming weeks, we are going to study the church in more depth. And next week, we will have a session about the church in unity and what it means to be one church, one blood. And then we will talk about the church and reconciliation. And then we will have a session about the church and justice. So I very much look forward to having a discussion with this wonderful group of participants in the John Perkins Bible study about the church and what it means in our lives. So join us in ensuing weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
JP, did you have anything you want to add before Ray comes yeah. and brings us the lesson? Yeah. Uh, there's a great statement by James in the early days of the church when the miracles after the resurrection and, and this Jesus who they crucified was performing all these miracles through the apostles and the leaders. And James asked a question at the first church council. What is God doing in the world with these miracles and wonders? He said, he's calling out from among the nation, the Gentile nation and the Jews. And God formed a nation to bear his name before the world. That's the name of the church. Those who are being called out for, by his name to be the reconcilers and the peacemakers in the world. Hmm. Talk to us, and I know you're going to talk about us, about I consider the all in all uh, in terms of God's gifts to us. And that's the gift of love. So speak to us, dear brother. Mm, thank you, Dr. Perkins. It's such a privilege. Here are these uh, two magnificent verses that we all know well, and we never uh, get tired of. Uh, John 13, 34, and 35. Jesus said, a new command I give you, Love one another. As I have loved you, so you also must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, there's a lot of love in the world today. Parents love their kids. Uh, citizens love their countries. Fans love their teams. It's all wonderful. The world is, at one level, a loving place, but it isn't the love of Jesus. It's the kind of love that fits in too well with the status quo of this world. But the love of Jesus wonderfully disrupts the status quo of this world. The love of Jesus, as you were just saying, Dr. Perkins, is creating a whole new world, a new race. And we who follow Jesus have the privilege right now of looking like we will always do this imperfectly, but we can do it really and visibly and sincerely. We have the privilege of looking like his new world, the new world only he can create, we can look like that even right now in the midst of worldly love that disappoints and worldly love that betrays and worldly love that views people in terms of a cost benefit calculation. Worldly love that backs out if the relationship starts costing too much. The love of Jesus is creating not just a new community but a new kind of community where anyone who is heartbroken and fed up with small love can enter in through the blood of Christ, be received, be embraced, and experience the beauty of costly love, real love, the love of Jesus appearing in this real world through real sinners like us in whom Jesus lives. Now, that is not easy to live that way, to be that way together. But it's worth everything. <clears throat> so these uh, verses, John 13, 34, and 35, I'm, I'm so glad we're here this morning, Dr. Perkins, because uh, these verses meant so much to my dad. And uh, he, he embodied these verses, and he preached these verses. I heard him preach on these verses many times. 
I, I remember the outline he used, and I'm going to steal it from him today. I'm going to use his outline. One, the command of Christ. Two, the example of Christ. And three, the promise of Christ. So let's think it through in that very way. One, the command of Christ. A new command I give you, love one another. Now, Jesus, when he says a new command, he's speaking to us as our king. A new command I give you. He has every right to command us. And, and this is striking. His command is also a gift, a new command I give you. So Jesus is speaking to us here both with authority and with grace. He is the king of all mercy. And as he says this to us, he feels this deeply. The words, a new command, are emphatic in the text. Jesus is excited about this. He is moved by this. He is eager to say this to us. He is eager for us to receive this. He knows what a difference this command will make. So he isn't giving us a new option. He's giving us a new command because he knows this is the way his heart will reach the world. So Jesus gave us this command, as, as you know, uh, the night before he died. And as someone once said to me, last words are lasting words. Jesus wants us to remember this new command every day as long as we live. And he is not asking us by saying a new command I give you. He's not asking that we would fit this into the margins of our busy lives and our crazy schedules. He is telling us to reshape our schedules and our priorities and our emotions and relationships and reshape everything in our lives around his command as the new sacred center of everything that's important to us. This, he's speaking to us at that level because it means so much to him. He died to make this real to us. Many other things could have occupied his mind that night, that fateful night before he died, but it was, it was this new command that we love one another as he loved us. This was what moved his heart when everything was on the line. And by the way, the word uh, you, a new command I give you is, of course, it's plural, not singular. His command is not just for the individual, but for all of us together. He's, it, this command is not just for an individual here or there that has kind of a, a knack for relationships, uh, the extrovertish kind of person. Uh, his, his command gathers us. By this command, he reaches out with his mighty and gracious arms and pulls us all in together, close to his heart. And this isn't for pastors only, sort of as the professionals, while you know, other people can look on as the spectators. Jesus is commanding the pastors, and he's commanding the members and the people all together, all of us. Everyone is involved. Everyone matters. If anyone sits it out, everyone experiences a little less of this glory. No one can be a passenger. Everyone is to be lifted up closer to the Lord by saying, uh, giving a definite yes to the command of Jesus. And then, then, the life flows among us. So the command of Jesus <clears throat> has the power. You know, every time the Lord gives us command, he also, with the command, gives us the grace to obey the command. He's a good king. He's an all-sufficient king. We, there is nothing about him we need to worry about or brace ourselves against or filter out. When he speaks to us with a, a word of authority and command, he also speaks into us every grace that we're going to need to obey that command. So this command, 
by his grace, has the power to make us today living proof of his love that comes from far beyond this world. I hear you. And he showed us what this love looks like. And that takes us to point two. So first of all, the command of Christ, a new command I give you that you love one another. And secondly, the example of Christ, the example of Christ, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. <laughs> that's amazing. In many ways, here's one way that's amazing. Jesus is offering himself to us here. He's presenting himself to us as the world's foremost authority on love. <laughs> He's the expert. He gets it. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So he, he offers himself to us. He makes himself the example of love. And he does so with no embarrassment. He's not apologizing for saying this. Now, as I said, that's amazing. Either Jesus is crazy or Jesus really is love. I believe we believe that Jesus was and is the best example of love we have ever seen sent down into this world from God above. And here's how that amazes me. If Jesus is the living embodiment of love, the example of love, the illustration of love, the proof of love, real love, then sent down from God, then we have parachuted into a universe where ultimate reality is not cold, dark, blank space, but ultimate reality is a heart of sacrificial love for the undeserving, that comes down to bring us together, paying the penalty for our sins, removing every reason why we should run the opposite direction. And he brings us together into a joyous unity that only God can create. Evil is not ultimate. Betrayal is not ultimate. Evil is secondary and temporary. Love is ultimate. The love of Christ is on the right side of history. God came down to us in Christ and then went further down beneath us to the cross where we would never have gone. And the night before Jesus made that ultimate sacrifice on his way to the cross, he paused in this moment turned around, looked at us, and said, follow me. Follow me into this love. Follow me into the love of the cross. He commanded us to love one another, not with our love, but with his own love. So, we're all realizing Jesus was so not crazy when he said, as I have loved you, you are to love one another. One another. Here's, here's another way we can think about this. <laughs> if everyone on the face of the earth suddenly loved you with the love of Jesus, and if you suddenly loved everyone on the face of the earth with the love of Jesus, and if I did too, would we be complaining about all the crazy going around? <laughs> or would it feel like heaven on earth? His love really is the best example of love we've ever seen and ever will. It's not as though we should wait and hold out for something better. 
He has come. He has shown us. We know now. And his example quickly becomes our personal reality for every one of us. We should love others. That's clear from the Bible in many passages. But in this passage, he commanded us to love one another. I mean, the people right around us, the people already in our lives, the people in our pasts, the people at church, the people in our families, the people in our dorm rooms, the brothers and sisters already in our lives, following his sacrificial example. We should, he's not just saying go love others. He's saying love one another. This is mutual. This is back and forth. This is shared. This is giving love, receiving love, loving one another back and forth. Wherever the spirit of Jesus goes, he creates a new kind of community with new ground rules, a new kind of community where no sincere person has anything to fear, a new kind of community where predatory people don't stick around because it's obvious to them that we have each other's backs and we're sticking up for each other and we're watching over one another. We're for each other. A new kind of for you community because Jesus is for us and he always will be. Back in the Old Testament, God said, love your neighbor as yourself. And that set a high standard, but Jesus took it even further. He did not love us as himself. He loved us above himself. John chapter 13 starts out that way. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. He never backed out. He never pulled back, no matter what the cost. He was all in. He never put himself first. So his command creates our new reality together. This is the end of our kind of love setting the ground rules and a new beginning of his kind of love creating new ground rules, new understandings, new courage together, this kind of love. When we start feeling a little bit scared about where this might take us, this kind of love, that's good. That's a good indicator. We're actually seeing new vistas, new possibilities of what he can do now through us. So instead of being guarded and careful that no one is going to get too much from me, I'm going to set the, the limits here. Uh, the Old Testament, when it said, love your neighbors yourself, started to sort of loosen our grip on that small love in our hearts. And then Jesus came and followed up and showed us the full reality of his kind of love at the cross. Love your neighbor as yourself was glorious. Love one another as I have loved you. That's heaven on earth. The Bible says, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. The Bible says, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus did not remain alone, isolated by himself, playing it, it, playing it safe, pain-free. He loved and he suffered for it. In this world, love 
always suffers. But the sufferings of love are the only creative force for good in all this world. The sufferings of love reshape and redefine the future. And that's what we're here for. The early church understood this. The people, the, the Roman Empire was brutal. It was horrible. Then the Christians began to appear in their churches, their communities all over the Roman Empire. And the, the, the people of Rome had never seen anything like this. And they looked at the Christians and, and uh, Tertullian in the second century told us, here's what the Romans were, are saying about the Christians. See how those Christians love one another, how they are ready even to die for one another. And we today, I mean, I'm looking at the example of Christ. As I have loved you, you must love one another, friends. This is a privilege we really don't even deserve. But if God gives us this privilege, let's be ready. Let's be prepared in heart and mind, literally, to die for one another. Then, the more willing we are to love sacrificially, the world will know Jesus has come to town. And he's creating a new world in, this, in the midst of this world. Friends, we do not need any political power to follow the example of Jesus. We only need Jesus and hearts open to him with the, his Holy Spirit living within us. And here is the difference following his example by his power, by his grace. Here's the difference he makes. Third point, the promise of Christ. Verse 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, here is something that is, Francis Schaeffer uh, pointed this out to me many years ago, and I've, I've never quite recovered from it. Do you see what Jesus is giving to the world here in these words? The Lord is giving every unbeliever the right to judge us, the right to judge, the right to decide whether you and I are true followers of Jesus. If we are unloving, if we are selfish and cold, if we are sharp-tongued, if we are divisive and demanding, Jesus is not saying we aren't Christians but he is saying that no one will know that we are Christians. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus himself gives unbelievers the right to decide what we really are, whether we are Christians or just big talkers. And if some unbelievers are skeptical about us today, maybe they're simply exercising the right Jesus gave them. <clears throat> so it matters so much. So much is on the line here. There are many ways people will not know we really do love the Lord and really do follow him. Being right doesn't make us convincing. The Pharisees were right. They were always right. Knowing a lot will not necessarily give us credibility either. The Bible says knowledge can puff up. There are many ways people will not know that Jesus is really present in the world today through us together as a community. 
there are, but there is a way people can know Jesus is here and he's locatable among us. And anyone can come in, any troubled, burdened person, any person with regrets, any person with embarrassment, any person who's fed up with their life can come in among us and experience Jesus as he really is. And that one way we can display him, he has already, he has appointed this for us. He has told us how this works. It's when we love one another as he loved us. So how we treat one another gently, how we speak to one another and about one another respectfully, how we forgive one another quickly, how we serve one another cheerfully, how we rejoice over one another sincerely. The Bible sets the emotional tone we can share together. I love Psalm 16, 3, for example. Psalm 16, 3 says, as for the saints in the land, that's you and me, we are in Christ. That, so the saints in the land is Old Testament code language for believers in Christ. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. So you are the saints in the land. And here's how the Bible teaches me to perceive you. Because this is who you really are. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones. You are the excellent ones. And, and 15 or 20 seconds into a conversation with you, the excellencies just start showing up. So I find myself in a conversation with any one of you. We, we, get, we start to meet each other. And I say, I ask you, so, so where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to high school? Tell me your story. And you start talking. And I'm thinking as I'm listening, 15 seconds in, I'm thinking, this is amazing. This is a story of God's care, God's grace, God's mercy. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones <clears throat> in whom is all my delight. And that's where I and every one of us, that's where we make a personal emotional commitment in whom is all my delight. We don't hold back. So there's no playing it cool, no aloofness. We move toward one another with joyful commitment. So Jesus makes our love for one another the mark of his true disciples. We are how he makes himself visible in the world today. We are the model home of the new neighborhood God is building out in eternity so that people can <clears throat> come in to this model home, us, and see the future now and buy in while there's still time. And we will never find a group of Christians that's always easy to love. But we can be sinners who, for Jesus' sake, are for one another because he is for us and he always will be. Thank you. God be with you. Okay, okay, okay. This is your time. And... and this is precious time. In our, in our location, where we are at in our development, we are in that 50 days between the crucifixion and Pentecost. We're trying to prepare this generation for that loving Holy Spirit to possess us Amen. In a way that we can go out and be world changers, community changers. We become the example, example of Christ in us. The Christian life in Galatians 2.20 tells us, 
tells us that the Christian life is the outliving of the in-living Christ. Paul says it this way, as Ray is saying it. I, to myself, has been crucified to Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in us. And the life that we now live in the flesh, we live by the faith and the grace of the love of God who loves us and gave himself for us. And we become that transform, reconcile people. We do not make hate a value. Mm. Hate a value. That's part of what has happened to us now. It's your sin, not mine. Boy, we are individually broken. And the church's task to put us back together again, put us back in Christ. It, being in Christ is the hope of the world. And it's our hope for a broken world. I want to listen. I want to hear. This is our time. This is the critic. And I don't want a lot of sermon. I want to really, let's diagnose if we can, uh, digest, what Ray have said. What did you hear the Spirit of God? Mm-hmm. This, this is that time of listening. This is that time of waiting. Don't tell us too much about how to. That's what we're saying. Tell us what is God saying to you. Saw it on a personal way. Don't tell me a whole lot about somebody else's sin. This Bible class is for us. This Bible class is our washing and our rewashing. Mm. When we leave this Bible class, we're going out being salt and light in our world. Okay. Not too long question. What are you hearing? I I see. I want to speak because. I have never heard the word uh, that Jesus was excited to give us this command the night before he died. And suddenly what the Lord said to me, and that is he knew he was going to send the Holy Spirit so we might be able to love one another. If we we grow in our relationship with him, we have a chance. Because now he's going to be in us. And so every day when I forget to love this guy well, or anybody who comes, if I don't pay attention to them or uh, really relate, I, I can say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Yeah. Please yeah. fill me again. That's so good. That, that's the answer. That's the answer. He's going to wash all of your doubts and sins away. Oh, he washes all our doubts. If we confess our sin, he's faithful in jail. I think that's where we got to go. We lose too much time talking about other people's sin. We need to be talking about the Savior, singing about him. <clears throat> oh, I like one of those old songs. I love the Lord. He heard my prayer and pitied every wrong. Long as I live. And trouble all around me rise. I'll hasten to his throne. We want this Bible class to be both a prayer meeting, a listening time. Okay, look, what are you hearing? Um, Curtis, right hand question there. Wait, Curtis. Um, Is it always- Go ahead, Curtis. Go ahead, you can read it. I don't. I don't know about a question. I had so many things going on in my brain while uh, the Lord was just speaking this morning. I love that you reminded us, Brother Ray, of the fact that while we live in a democracy, we are under the rulership of a theocracy, a king who is good, and his commands are not burdensome or grievous. 
And so I was just so encouraged. Um, and I, I don't have much to, to dissect. I have a whole lot to digest. And I just feel like it's such a holy moment that I'm like, Lord, help me to lean into this and walk this out. Because it's easy to love those who are lovable, but it's hard to love those that I perceive as not lovable or I perceive as an enemy. And so the fact that you bring us back to this place of love and that we have a king who not only gives us this command that he delights in, but then he actually models it out. I'm like, he, he's done the heavy lifting. So thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Um, we don't have a lot of questions because um, I believe that he gave, this is, this is just a command and, and um, you can't question it, but we do have a lot of comments. Um, give, give me your sharp, quick yeah, I, comment. You're telling us how you feel and this is important. This I would like to see. Rosemary, I would like to see. Rosemary, go ahead. Oh, okay. You know, listening to this, and I'm going to be honest that I've been convicted of being so gifted, but God grace helped me to, to um, digress all of this, that I've been wrong in what I have been calling love. I have been loving those who love me and looking down on those that, that doesn't return to love or looking down on someone else that is not where I think they should be, that I have not been loving my family the way that um, I should be loving them as an image of Christ, as me being the one that is saved. And I just went to the Lord and asked him to forgive me, not to sit here and act like I'm so self-righteous that I don't have any of this this stuff in me, I just want it washed out of me. I, I do want to be that image of Christ and love people unconditioned. And it's a challenge. And I keep going to the Lord. It is a challenge. But I realize I am willing. I am willing to get out of my way because I'm in my way, in my thoughts, through my eyes, through my ears. And I don't want that stuff in me anymore. Amen. This Amen. is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Come on. Ty, come on here. Todd Dorham. Hello. Yeah, Rosemary, amazing. I, I feel the exact same way. And thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I have a question surrounding the scripture, John 15, 13. Great, no greater love hath man than this, than a man willing to lay down his life for his friends. And People look at that in the literal context of actually dying and certainly of Jesus dying for us. But I'm wondering if that scripture can be interpreted as in that we're willing to lay down our life and the things we have planned for the day and the things we have planned for our week and our careers and all and all this to actually share love for somebody else that we're, we're setting aside our priorities and and reprioritizing those that are seemingly unlovable like can that be interpreted in that same way that it's not just the actual physical death but but um to have set aside to to go after those that are quote unquote unlovable is that worthy of that interpretation go go uh, ahead ray. ray yes i i believe it is i think you're exactly on the right track because if if we are willing to lay down our lives, then everything short of that is also right out on the table. We're not holding anything back. So I, I, I strongly agree, Todd, with what you're proposing, that when we follow the call of Christ, we can't predict in advance how it's going to go. Yeah, He doesn't tell us, but what we can do and what he does call us to do and does tell us to do is moment by moment, whether it's a big step to take or a small step to take, that next step is always a yes to him, whatever the cost. And yes. it, if, if that, surely that's what it means to follow Jesus. And then he decides 
whether the it's a matter of, of inconvenience and preference or whether it's a matter of our, our veins being opened and our lifeblood pouring out. He decides that. But our answer to him is always yes for the sake of others. Always yes. All right. Thank, thank you, Pastor. Um, thank you. We have uh, Curtis Anderson and then Philip has a question after Curtis Anderson. Yes, how are you doing, Dr. Perkins and Pastor Ray Orland? I'm Curtis out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, thank you for the word that you said, and I, I appreciate that. And the question that I have, the scripture that you uh, referenced on verse 35, by this, all people would know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I'm really appreciative of you bringing that out because I think that we forget about, you know, I work in a space where I'm actually around a lot of unbelievers, and sometimes we forget that they need to see Christ's love in us. And so the question I have, as I was really, you know, striving to, as I work on a, uh, an urban farm in inner city, South Dallas, and one of the things we, we have a lot of churches and, you know, ecumenical community that comes along and tries to help us work with the marginalized. Well, the question I have as it pertains even to verse 35, I've been coming across a lot of people who are really, really liberal. And the question that I have, a lady came to me, she said, man, I came out of my class and it told us to love, uh, love one another as we love our neighbors. You know how the, the scripture is. And so she was saying that loving your neighbor means accepting anything. Like there is no, you know, she was like, if a person, you know, she went into the detail in her class. Like if a person is gay, they should be able to be ordained as bishop and all that and I was just blown away how you would handle that too and how somebody can also misinterpret what love is Ray did you understand that I know I thought there was a lag I think I got enough of it and and my answer would be okay. my answer would be the word command in verse 34 Jesus levels with us speaks to us honestly when he speaks to us as our king, as the one who is redefining our terms according to his own terms. So if I open up the Bible and read it my way and give myself the authority to redefine what he said, uh, I am only proving he is not my king and, and we, we have to gently and respectfully, calmly um, show people another way and show people the beauty of coming under the Lordship of Christ. If we try to re-portray re his face in the world, redraw his face in the world, change the face of Christ in the world. We are not his subjects. We are not even his friends. We are his enemies. Now, he loves his enemies. <laughs> um, but we have the privilege of being living proof of how beautiful it is, how humane it is, how life-giving it is, not life-depleting it is to come under the rule of Christ and bend the knee and be taught by him rather than tell him he got it wrong and we're here to set him straight because that's what they're doing. We can't do that. Wow. Go ahead. Amen. That was, that, that was um, excellent. Thank you so much for that question, Curtis. And um, we had, Philip had a question. Well, I just wanted to say, uh, I'm calling Mr. Reverend Dr. Lake Avenue, if you ever been to Pasadena, <laughs> you know where Lake Avenue is. And this message blew my mind, blew my mind right out of the water. And it first started when he's, my first note is the gift of love is God's new commandment to me first hmm. and to the world. Amen starting with the church. And I'm, I'm like, my dad asked me the other day, he said, do you love Trump? <laughs> Can you love <laughs> Trump? I said, well, I, I'm, I said, I, I feel sorry for Trump, you know, but is that loving Trump? 
So, you know, I got a lot of work to do. Yeah, and so I wanna, well. But, you know, my dad is always quoting these old songs, but I got a new song with this message today. And I wrote it. It's called A Life of Love. A life of love, a life of peace. Oh, holy God, help us to see, help us to be. In all thy ways, help us to see the Son of God, O Lamb of God, the Prince of Peace. The second verse is a life of love, a life of peace. O Son of God, help us to see. Come set us free Amen. deep in our hearts. If we believe abundant life, a holy life, we will receive. The last verse says, Amen. a life of love, a life of peace, the bread of life. You are indeed, you calm the sea. Oh, precious Lord, rain down on me. Love, joy, and peace. Oh, Lord, release your oh, perfect man. peace. That's Amen. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> this, was, this was awesome to me. I mean, this life changing. I'm so glad I was here. Wow. Thank you. Okay, keep going here. The spirit is working. The spirit is speaking. Um, uh, who was it? Joy St. Catherine. Joy. Hello. Where are you from, Joy? I'm calling from um, St. Catharines in the Niagara Falls region of Canada. Um, and um, I heard about um, Dr. John M. Perkins from the University of Toronto uh, School of Theology because all the uh, first year Masters of Divinity students have to um, write a paper about <laughs> John M. Perkins. Dr. John M. Perkins. So I found about this Bible study from it. Um, and I was just wondering from the Bible study, um, and I really like the topic of church and mission that Dr. John Perkins keep asking about. Um, and I was just wondering before just really diving into church and mission, um, what do you think are, um, like what, what is the, the correct theology, uh, to practice leadership in mission? And, and the reason why I, I, I asked about that is because, um, someone else before me, I think it was Curtis was saying that there's a lot of liberal Christians and um, he was just blown, blown away by, um, you know, just the division that is going on between liberal and conservative Christianity in terms of their theo uh, theology and praxis. So then, and I know that, uh, Dr. Ray tried to address it, but I, I thought it was like really broad. And I was just wondering um, how can we, in terms of pastoral theology and missiology, just really be reconcilers um, if there's any more specifics rather than more of the, you know, philosophicals. I don't know if you understand my question. Because, uh, like, I know uh, Dr. Uh, Perkins was saying that our mission is to be reconcilers, like gracious reconcilers. And oh, I just... Daddy, can you yeah. take that question? JP, did you understand that question? Uh, I, I did not. I did not understand the question. I, um, I, I did I did not. Can you pinpoint what you were saying? You got to be a little bit more. Were you talking about John Perkins being a liberal? No. Did you? Well, understand no, that? no, no. Well, no, not liberal. But I know that 
um, you wrote a forward to a book called Woke Theology, and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but just in the context of how can we be more specifically uh, reconcilers when we see clearly that there's a tension and division in the unity of Christ amongst liberal Christians and conservative Christians. Yeah, well, that is so messed up that you, uh, I would have to understand demonology to see how I, some of our evangelical Christians are behaving. So I, you are really getting deep, and that's wonderful. So, great is the mystery of godliness. So, so you really you and I sure don't want to demonize any individual. Uh, you know, in my in my thoughts and uh, uh, life, I I sort of hear it, but. Uh, Ray was saying, I'm not claiming my enemies. I know they're out there. I'm trying to love them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to do words that even demonize them. I, I believe that the love of God has the spirit with it. We are born of the spirit. And I think it's that way we understand the mysteries of godliness and what we are, the world is confused right now. And we're trying to bring the church back to see its mission here on earth. Uh, I think that's, that's what I understand right. we are seeking for. Ray, think, Ray, would you like to add to that? Uh, just this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Perkins. I would say that when we're interacting with someone who doesn't take the Bible straight, we should listen carefully and answer their questions, their objections, doubts, and reservations as helpfully and clearly as we can, but, and, and always be respectful and loving. Uh, but the whole point is to help people find the real Jesus and to guide them uh, in his direction. So uh, when I am interacting with a theologically liberal person, I want that person to leave our conversation with two very clear impressions. One, I really care about them. Two, I really disagree with them. And I'm offering an alternative, the biblical Jesus. Yes, let's Let's move on. Thank, Thank you, dear. You so much. That, was, that was great. Um, we also had uh, Brad Wu. He had a question. Yes. Good morning. Thank you, J Dr. Perkins and Dr. Erlen. Thank you so much. I want to draw upon your many years, your long obedience in the same direction of pastoring and administering to people and applying it to John 13, 34, and 35 as a pastor because sheep bite and it gets hard. I was just at a church in North St. Louis yesterday where a white pastor and a black pastor stood up publicly and beautifully reconciled in love with one another, but they had been at odds. They had been struggling and it's hard. Ministry as pastors is hard today. So what's your encouragement as I see so many pastors struggling to love people in this season of, of where we're at right now in the States? Yeah. To me, that's what our Bible class here. I, I'm coming here trying to solve the through uh, this mystery of hate and and this mystery of it's somebody else's fault for all of my sins. So I gotta hate you. I, I think we're in a difficult place. Mm -hmm. I think we gotta hear God speak. And, and that's and I'm listening to, the, to, to everyone on this program. I want to hear what you are saying or what God is saying to you. I want to hear our struggles. But we got the alt is what Ray was doing this morning. The alts are there. We should love one another because love is a God. He that loves is born of God and no God. 
He that love is not, knows not God. So what God is calling us was self-evaluation mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. Self-evaluation. And not, not them liberals, not those right-wing conservatives. They are against each other. <laughs> they are deeply against each other. And they have deeply lost their mission. When you want to kill your leaders, mm. put hanging nukes for the vice president of the United States. Mm. It, is, it is something they don't know what the Constitution is about. Mm. When you see people don't know what the Constitution, we never lived it. We've never lived it. So, so we're in a tight place. And, and I think it's going to be our own listening. And I want this Bible class here to be an expression of you. I, I'm not telling you to be quiet with your question. Mm-hmm. I'm saying and we want to struggle with you with that question. Are we trying to fix ourselves? But we're, in the meantime, we're trying to fix ourselves so we can be that salt and light mm-hmm. in the world. That's, that's right. Right. Frank, Frank, do you so, have a question? Frank Oakley and then Curtis uh, Price and then Jody Sargent. Yeah, uh, just uh, real quick, what I've been hearing uh, the Holy Spirit uh, talking to me through listening to this morning's conversation is just kind of uh, what was, it was just a further confirmation of, um, we just really love is gonna answer everything because the more that we love one another, the more that we can move and do things. And it made me think, cause I hear a lot of questions being asked today. And it just made me think of like, I think the reason why us as a body, we're taking a big hit uh, just with people wanting to be, um, you know, wanting to maybe be Christians and things like that is just because we're step, we've stepped away from, from true love. And that's why we see other communities like maybe the LGBT plus community and other organizations uh, having a lot of people uh, be interested in that way of life because they are really good at showing love to everybody. Now, love doesn't always mean we uh, agree with everything, but just like that group or any other group, they're good at showing love, but they don't agree with everything that other people do either. So I think it, it, it's kind of that same principle of, if we can be true, honest, good examples of loving one another and then extending that same love, grace and mercy and other fruits of the spirits to people who are not believers, that will get people curious to be like, what are they doing different? I want to be I want to be close to them, just like we are with like we see with other groups of people. And then it brought me to this verse here, Second Timothy uh, 2, 23 through 24. Uh, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that the Lord, you, you know that they breed quarrels and the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone able to teach patiently enduring evil. And because of that, um, we don't need to be too concerned about liberal this, conservative this, like we may have fundamental disagreements, but don't quarrel because it'll breed controversies. And that's what's gonna keep people being like, I'm cool on this Christian stuff these people over here or this organization over here has it more together because they're being loving and just like uh dr ray has said earlier i forgot the verse but that that just was amazing where i was just like and i'm paraphrasing the verse but essentially they uh, non-believers have the right to essentially judge us because they see us not acting in love so i mean yeah it, it's kind of all over the place i'm the same place where curtis is where it's just a lot of uh, digesting versus dissecting, but that's just kind of where I'm at. Well, you are so encouraging, guy. You are so encouraging, Frank. Um, Ray, what, um, what's your take on that? Oh, I deeply agree with what Frank was was saying just now, and and also to the pastor just before Frank. You know, with for, for every difficult relationship, build into your life. Uh, an encouraging relationship. For example, right now this morning, I'm on this Zoom call with Dr. John Perkins. <laughs> Come on, I'm so energized. I'm built up. I'm ready to go take that hill. So uh, yeah, let's let's always 
get back together with, with brothers and sisters that inspire us and put new uh, energy into us. And we'll keep going. We'll keep going together. Amen. Amen. Uh, Jody had her hand raised. We have Jody mentioned Sargent it. or, um, or uh, Taylor, Taylor Green had a comment. There is. Uh, or, yes. Oh, sorry. This is Taylor. Um, but yeah, my comment was, um, as I've been listening and was thinking about Joy's question, um, just wanted to say that something that's been really impacting to me is um, something that John, that Dr. Perkins, that you said as well about listening, um, like listening for understanding and asking questions from curiosity. So when there's places of difference, um, our love um, can sit in grace to hear what has shaped another person's perspective, like understanding their story, um, because the Holy Spirit um, is with us in that time and can help us to have clarity and discernment. Um, and also, yeah, just thinking about how we can be in the body and our agreement is in Christ um, and the way that we live that out is being like refined um, all together and yeah, that happening through conversation. Um, this, this is a question that I have as well. Uh, we were, we're focusing on, um, or some of the questions I focused on LGBTQ um, conversation and difference in theology um, based on things uh, that we see in scripture. And I, I wonder, um, I, I just feel, I feel convicted that there are some things that I emphasize in scripture that Jesus says, or that I see Jesus saying, and others that I de-emphasize, because Jesus also had hard words to say about greed, about um, rich riches, and about marriage. Um, so I wonder how we can bring a holistic view to this conversation, so we're not just focusing on one area of disagreement. You want to take that, JP? Yeah, I I think I hear something good and positive coming out of what you are hearing uh, as we talk. We are offering some absolute here, and that is the absolute of love. And that if we can find a way to receive each other and remove the hostilities in our own life, uh, I think that's what Christianity is all about, is living a life of love in a hostile and fallen world. And the answer and the solution is our behavior. And our behavior should be a behavior of love. And we get sidetracked by judging other people on, on, them, on themselves when we should be looking internally and letting the Holy Spirit, um, you know, be being from us. Well, they see yeah. Jesus in, um, in our face. Okay, we, we're getting um, close to the we, end. We are getting close to the end. We have uh, Curtis Price. Did I call on you already? Curtis Price, your hand is up. Oh, um, that's okay. Thank you so much. I, I actually have to leave here pretty soon for another meeting, but oh. um, here's my question and my concern. Um, in lieu of what Dr. Ray um, taught us about, uh, in, in John. Um, I am seeing Christian nationalism as a clear and present danger to the body of Christ. Um, and so, and I'm disturbed by that. Um, and my question is for both Dr. Perkins and Dr. Ray, in lieu of the scripture that was taught and shared how is the love of Christ manifested when we in dealing with brothers and sisters of Christ who are falling for the lie of Christian nationalism? My concerns are that I don't, I, and I don't know if this is happening or not. My concerns are that I don't know if enough 
pastors are out there preaching from the pulpit about this clear and present danger and what it represents to us as the body of Christ. When I think of the love of Christ in helping somebody uh, with this situation, I'm seeing it's like it's a rescue mission. We're rescuing somebody from a lie that's going to deter them away from the truth that is in Jesus. Um, but I don't know if pastors are preaching about it, uh, about the danger. I don't know if we're discipling people through this. And I don't know if it's being taught about what Christian nationalism is, what's it, you know, the, the lie behind it, and how, again, it is a clear and present danger to the body of Christ in our present day. Just like um, to hear any responses to that. Yeah. Oh, Ray, would you take that? Sure. Um, pastors and elders in our churches, I think it comes down to what's going on in our actual churches. And uh, for example, uh, it, and pastors have got to be clear. For example, after the terrible murders at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston some years ago, you know, I, I couldn't come to the next Sunday and say nothing. That's inconceivable. So, and neither did I want to build a whole sermon around the work of the devil. So what I did was I built a special five minute statement early in the service. We sang a couple of songs and I stood up. This is not something I do very often, but when there's a terrible national event that cries out for it, like the attack on the Capitol, something like that, a terrible national event that's, that demands to be addressed, um, I stood up and I called it out and I called sin, sin. And I said, in effect, that has no place here in this church. In this church, we are going to love one another. We're going to protect and defend and stick up for one another for Jesus' sake. I made it very clear. And so that if there were any um, white supremacists in the church, they would know their white supremacism is not okay. And all the people who are afraid that their skin color uh, might make them, uh, might marginalize them in this church, they knew and they felt, oh, I belong here, I'm safe here. So pastors must be very clear while at the same time in churches, while at the same time not allowing the devil to change the subject. So it takes a lot of wisdom, courage, and forthrightness. But you're absolutely right, brother. If, if people are not hearing their pastors calling sin, sin, then pastors are not doing their job. So let's do our job. Amen. For, for Thank Jesus. you. Um, Edith, David had a question. Edith, Hello, um, can you hear me? Can yeah, you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. This is rich and this is uh, good. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ray, for answering that. Yes, we as pastors should be calling it out. And that's what I'm doing. But my comment is what I hear God saying uh, um, from last week to this week, uh, how God is speaking to us. He's healing. He wants to heal his church. Amen. And his church has the power. We're yeah. the only ones that has the power. So my comment, uh, what well, Jesus speaks to us as our king. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ray. Mm -hmm. He speaks to us as a king. It's a command. So we don't try to redefine what the king has already commanded us to love one another. And he has given us the grace to do so, to command the Christ. Uh, uh, and he has lived the example before us mm -hmm. and he has given us the promise mm -hmm. that uh, as we follow him, he will give us the grace and the power to heal among us, the church. Yes, we are to call it out sin, sin, but our king has spoken. Amen. And so I thank you for that. I, I, I hear that when he's initiating the church in the Great Commission, all power in heaven and in earth 
is in my hand. Go Amen. you therefore and teach his life to teach his commandment. Yeah. And he called this one it's an old one, but it's not an old one. It was here from the beginning that he intended us. The whole mission came out of his love for us. But God so loved the world and his people that he came himself and died for us. And that his love is a solution, is example. Mm -hmm. And that's what Ray was saying this morning. And that's what we were listening to. And we really want to take this personally because we are diverse. And so, and we, are, we sort of know a lot of going on. And it's how we're going to personally navigate this in the world. Because I think we've lost a sense of who is the center? Who is the center? It's the other son is not me. Yeah. It's the other son is not me. Okay. Yes. So we're getting close. This is so fine. Um, we have, let's get one more. Uh, um, Randy Neighbors had a comment. Uh, Randy, are you still on? Um, He's a I have a question. Yes. Okay. I have a question. Okay, yes. uh, who is that, Jar Jared? Fletcher. Fletcher, okay, Fletcher, ask your question. He's out of Canada. Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you for giving me the time to talk. Uh, as I'm listening to this, I've been uh, uh, very encouraged uh, because I think this is much bigger than we think sometimes. And it's not just about America, but it's really about the world. The world is watching. And I'm thinking particularly in terms of global missions and racial relations. Uh, this has a huge impact in how we do mission in America, outside of America. And as an African last year, watching what was happening with George Floyd and all in the aftermath of all of that, it really began to raise questions in my mind as to how, you know, how authentic then can we, you know, can, can American missionaries be when they go to Africa, for example, uh, especially the white missionaries. So um, yeah, I, I, it's, I've, I've been wrestling with this a lot and maybe uh, Dr. Perkins, you can speak to that or Dr. Odland, uh, how can we keep our testimony credible uh, in mission work when we have all these problems? I think, right, you the pastor, would you comment? I think that's what yeah. you were trying to do, and I think that's what this Bible class here is about. And, but, and we also know we're in Babylon. We're yeah. in the confusion of tongues. And, and not only do I think to talk about love, I think about how do we... How do we magnify? How do we magnify this law? Okay, Brother Ray, you, you want to speak? Yes, give a final comment. Give your final thought, um, yes. Ray, please. What Fletcher has said is very significant and weighty. Yes. And um, I, I deeply believe in uh, what 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 you i'm just writing it down dr perkins we're in babylon a confusion of tongues wow. and at the holy spirit came down at pentecost to create a new community that uses the same words so that the word love among us because of the example of jesus we know what that word means now mm -hmm. we know how to walk that out now and we have been repositioned to see our decisions and our sacrifices along the way with clarity and with unity. Fletcher, you're right. But, but the, the, the credibility of the gospel does not hinge on the United States of America. Mm -hmm. The credibility of the gospel was established by the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Let's go prove it. Amen. That, that is a great... Um... 
uh, closing comments. So um, we're just so thankful and grateful that you've been with us, Ray. Um, you're a friend, and we love you. And please give your <laughs> wife and your famous dog a hello for us. <laughs> okay. That's a pleasure. 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 Love you all. God be with you. Okay, and let uh, let Randy Nabel uh, ask his question and lead us in prayer. So you won't okay. get much of an answer because you won't lead us in prayer. I'll just pray. Let's okay. pray. Father God, thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you uh, for Dr. Arlen. Thank you for Dr. Perkins. Please bless them in their ministries. And help us all, Jesus, to be like you. Help us to love our enemies. Help us even to love our friends. Help us to love those people who, Lord, who just tick us off with saying stupid things. And please, Lord, help us to realize how desperately we need your love and your forgiveness and your mercy. We have all failed you too many times. But thank you for the blood that cleanses us from all sin. Holy Spirit, help us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We can get to the um, other questions on the after show, but Chris Cannon? Yeah, you know, like, I, like you said, Priscilla, let's stay on the line and, and ask these questions. Everyone who's still Mary and Jan and Tim. Um, I, I wrote down being right isn't convincing love is. And that may be one of the practical steps we can all take on this call is to do something in response to what we heard today. And if you're not aware what's happening in Jackson right now, there's a water crisis and the, the, the pipes have burst under the streets and the, and the Perkins Foundation and all around and the kids in the school and the program are not able to get water out of their faucet they can drink. So we have a practical way for us to step up, all of us, and that is to, to donate to the Perkins Foundation. And if you want to designate that for water, if you're in a nearby community like Memphis or Nashville or any place you can get to, to, uh, the, to West Jackson, bring water in, to, uh, drive it in, uh, send money, donate. And the other thing is, too, is that we take this for granted, at least we can because of Zoom. But it was his, uh, Dr. Orban said, we're, we're able to spend these mornings with some amazing people. Uh, every Tuesday, and people spend hundreds of dollars to hear these folks speak at conferences, and we get the real blessing to have them talking to us right in our, our own living room. So if you haven't become a partner, can I encourage everyone to consider that? And if you're a member of a church or an organization, maybe we can all go and speak to the board or whoever has that authority and say, would you consider, would we, would we consider praying about being a partner with the Perkins Foundation? Uh, this is a volunteer-run organization. Priscilla, uh, uh, Elizabeth, and Deborah don't talk much about this. This has been the foundation from the beginning of people serving. So please consider supporting, making it happen, uh, getting water to the students and helping the ministry continue. And then finally, let me also remind us that we do hope to bring a team, uh, all of us. This, this has been the most engaging call I've been on so far, and I've been on almost all of them. The questions being asked, we would love to bring everyone down to Mississippi in September and do a, a Perkins Justice pilgrimage. We've done a few of these in the past, but we had to postpone them because of COVID. But it would be great to be face-to-face, -face, spend hours together in conversation, traveling through the Deep South, seeing locations in Montgomery and Selma, walk the bridge together and talk about these things. So just footnote to yourself, plan for September. Let's bring as many as we can to come down together and spend time together talking about these things. Stay on the call ask your questions, um, but really pray about the water crisis right now in Jackson, about love, right? Being right isn't convincing. Being right is not convincing, but love can be convincing in the name of Jesus. Amen? And, amen. And I'm JP right now and Ray Orland. Uh, you can sign off and uh, you can get you some breakfast, JP. Thank you so much, Ray. All right, we're going to enter into our after show. And if you have to go, then, you know, just um, ease on out. Like they say in the, um, in the old church, put your hand up and, and uh, ease on out. So uh, we just want to um, get into this now. Elizabeth, are you there? Do you, do you all know how wonderful it would be if I actually got to see y'all in person? Y'all came down here and we did a, 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 um, a pilgrimage together. That would be like the best pilgrimage for me ever. <laughs> So I just wanted to share share that, you know, after being on together 
so, so long and now um, possibly having the opportunity to meet you all in person, that would be such a, oh, such a wonderful time. Yeah, it will be. Um, uh, we, that, this lesson was, uh, was so, uh, it, it's making us have to look at ourselves. And I think that one good thing about this Bible study is that it's making us look at ourselves so that we're not so focused and, uh, and, and on judging everyone else, but that we love one another. Um, anyone, uh, let's see, Tim, you had your hand up during there. Um, Tim Green, I think it's Tim Green. How you pronounce Guys. that, Tim? Guys. Guys. Guys, where are you from, Tim? <clears throat> I live in Cleveland, Ohio. All right. I love Cleveland, the Cleveland okay. Clinic. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Well, uh, I, I just want to say first, it's been a pr real privilege to be part of this call. I've enjoyed it very much. And uh, the word I heard this morning that had an impact on me was the word command. So that was in the verse that Dr. Perkins shared. And it just affects my motivation. So uh, we can think, yeah, it's a good thing to love my neighbor. And maybe I want a relationship, but that's not really what it's about. It's simply a command. And I owe Jesus everything. So if he commands me to love somebody who's not lovable, somebody I don't like, somebody who, who maybe has insulted me or offended me, it's not really about the relationship with that person. And it's not about uh, me wanting to have a relationship it's simply about obeying my master and oh, wow. him everything <laughs> that's excellent excellent yeah. um jen g has you um you had a comment too jen uh tell us again where you're from uh i'm from tucson arizona okay yeah um uh, the, the, cool. yeah the thing i was thinking about as we talked today and it's probably good I didn't get to say it in the in the in the larger group, but I'm really struck by this thing about conservative versus liberal Christianity. And you know, it seems to me, I mean, I'm not God, right? I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but you know, the it, it's I get a little feeling of like superiority in in like we know the the right way and they're not right and i i'm not going to judge who's right or who's wrong because i think that's not my job uh but what i what i experience in that is it's when any of us say i really know what god i like i know and you don't um that feels like a dangerous place to me one because like who can really know god like the bible i mean it's so who can really know uh anyway so that's just sort of a big question in my head um but it, but it does speak to me like a house divided right like how can we just by saying like they it just automatically sets up division and I, it feels to me a little bit easy to, to go from, I know God, and I know the truth of, of God more than you do. It just seems like, like that has caused a lot of problems. <laughs> like the white church and the, you know, and the, our theology is better than theirs. Like, anyway, that just feels a little sticky to me. Well, um, you know, he said it, it's we're in the time at the Babel, okay, yeah. and uh, and we are um, not in the uh, the part all these parties and division. That's that's pretty much an affront to God. It's a it's a it's beneath our Lord and Savior. And so, um, as I believe it was Darwin, he said, we're in the party of the Lamb. All right, yeah. so we're not in that. We're just we're reflecting Christ from where we are. So. Thank you so much for that, Jen. Um, Mary, you had your hand up. Mary and Roger. It's kind of uh, tough 
question to answer, and I was looking for a Dr. Parkinson, Dr. Ortland to answer it, but I'm going to ask the question anyway for all of us to think. And I do understand love of one another, um, love your neighbor as yourself. My question is, some of us, some of you raised about homosexuality. Okay, this is my question regarding that, even in ab about abortion. I want all of us to think about the question that I'm going to ask. So I know to love homosexuals. I know to love the uh, people that have aborted their babies. But my question is a practical living as Christians following the word of God, following, the G following Jesus. Do you accept giving privileges for homosexual marriages? How biblical is it to accept I, we ought to love. I love homosexuals. My son's best friend is a homosexual young man. I pray for him every day. But is it appropriate, biblically, is it correct to accept and giving privilege to homosexuals when man and woman supposed to be a husband and wife? Can you call a man and man, husband and wife, or a husband and husband? Is it biblical? Is it a practical way of living? Is it acceptable as Christians? That's what my question was. Well, I, I think you know the answer to that question, Mary. I think now I what do. you're doing is you want our opinion. But I'm right, right. No, 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 not not opinion. no, 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 Elizabeth, I'm sorry. It's not the opinion. It's everybody needs to be clear on that. If we are teaching people about the way of living like Jesus, Love. we need to teach clearly in all aspects of the life. Love, teaching love is important. Loving others is important because it is a command. Every word, I take it as a command from the Bible. Every word, believe me or not. Okay. That's, that's all right. I'm... Thank you so much uh, for, for, your, for that comment, um, Mary. We appreciate we should it. Love, so we should love the sinner, not the sin. Amen, amen. Um, Curtis, would you like to... Uh, Tell us what you received from this message today, dear brother. Okay. Your torchbearer. <laughs> yeah. Um, I enjoy anytime I am lovingly redirected from a place of self introspection to a place of self examination. And I feel like the message that was taught help me to examine myself. Mm. <clears throat> Talk about something like love that we throw that word around all the time. Yep. It's, it's so trite. We, we, we love this, we love that, objects, a movie, an athlete. And so when you talk about biblical love, one thing that I think that we don't often think about is the cost of love, the cost of it. And you know how we are with our money, right? We, we, we like to find a good deal and we, need, we like to make sure that whatever we spend our money on, uh, it has a value to it. And sometimes I think that in us withholding love, even towards those who oppose us and don't agree with us, we actually innately devalue them. Mm -hmm. We're saying that you are not worthy of a love that I've been given freely. Wow. He called us up higher to not the option of love, but the command of love, regardless of the situation and regardless of the cost. Mm -hmm. and, like These are deep conversations that blacks and whites in the body need to hear constantly because all of us have a justifiable cause for why we withhold a love that we've been freely given. But it's not just to our king. And I love that he bringing out that it's a command from a king. And then we don't have a, a king who's like some any of our presidents, right? We have, we have leaders who institute practices that characters don't match the practices that they institute. But we have a king who is the epitome, his consistent nature and character. He actually models out what he calls us to do and then gives us the Holy Spirit enabling us to do it. And so-, so I, I get it, yes. Thank you so much, Curtis. That was amazing. Um, Melanie. I, I, I want to hear what, I, that's exactly what I was ready to call yeah, on. Mel Melanie. Melanie. 
<laughs> Your face like has you been have. talking to us. <laughs> you look like you're enjoying this time. Uh, what, what was meaningful for you um, in, in today's lesson? Oh, man, I tell you, I feel like it's just where God has me in terms of wrestling well with him, being angry at times as I talk to him so that I can get, get it out of me and I can be able to, to um, give back what he's already put inside of me, of experiencing his love as I felt through the church, the community. Um, my husband and I, we live in South Africa. The people of South Africa have loved us so well, in spite of sometimes I mess up a lot. I mess up a lot. And so it's just like, how can I lay down? Um, last night with our kids, we talked about, you know, carrying in our cross, whatever cross that is, but how can I lay it down so that I can genuinely love people and not, not, not for where I want them to be, but where they are right now. And, and I think that's just the challenge. And that's what I'm wrestling with, but it, it will be a cost as Curtis said, and there will be sacrifice. And so, so yeah, I mean, it, it just kind of like you said in my, in my driveway and you challenged me. Um, and it's exactly what I needed to hear today. So thanks guys. Yes, thank you so much. Now, Patricia, um, unmute, um, unmute yourself because I want you to come in. You were with us um, almost exactly one year ago today down here in Jackson. So um, we miss you, dear sister. <laughs> um, what did you find most meaningful today? I think just a reminder of you know, we know it, but we can't hear it enough. The power of the love of God, it is so, it's an upside down kingdom, right? You know, we're looking for a place of logic, you know, and I just put in the comment, people, we want to jump on a bandwagon of truth that's out here in society. And God requires this sensitivity to the Holy Spirit that no one can give us this one answer Oh, you know, it's, it's definitely a danger to identify with any camp, yeah. you know, like a, I'm liberal, I'm conservative, I'm this or that, or I align with this theory or that. I mean, <clears throat> things are very perverted in the world in most things. I mean, of course, we know there are some straight, just demonic stuff, but many things are twisted with truth. So it's laced with elements of truth, you know? And so I think we are in such desire to find a whole truth. <laughs> and there's really not a whole truth other than Christ himself. And that requires a relationship with him. That requires the work of keeping our hearts pliable before him, being sober, being vigilant as the word of God tells us to. And that is so countercultural to our society because we want someone to do the work for us. Go and find a theology, go and find a theory that I can jump on and just get in your camp and just be right out into the sunset with you. But it's not the case. So I just appreciate that one thing we know, like, like the word says, right? These three remain, faith, hope, and love. You know, and the greatest of these is love. And as simple as it sounds and it, it messes with us, we want a practical application. I know I do sometimes because, you know, I live in Cleveland and I see the broken communities and I see the division and I'm like, what can we do practically? And by the grace of God, he shows me some things. But ultimately, it goes back to that love of God. And it sure. does rub us because it goes against this logic, intellectual mind that we we have but through that you know we can rest in the lord so i appreciate this talk and i think we need to continue to lift up the love of christ because i mean love has made some bold statements in the word of god right love never fails that is deep and serious i, I think i was in the store and i saw this sign and it said love never fails i was like man period <laughs> you know that's, that's a period on that that's a period on that. Um, and it hey, is so sister. true Sister V, I, I wonder too, you made a statement, you said that um, we want practicality. I wonder if we drain the practicality from love mm. and so ethereal and spiritual. Because Jesus walked that out very practically with people. He did. And specifically those who are opposed to him. So I think maybe even the idea of making love more practical. Yes. True essence is what we need in the church. And the church needs to model it. I love that.
Amen. I appreciate you guys. Yep. And you know, um, uh, my dad, he, he makes it so simple. And Ray, they make it so simple. We want to make it all complicated, but it is so simple. And, it, and even in our own development, you know, everything that we teach children at the kindergarten level is what we ought to be doing. Um, there, there, I know um, there's a book called um, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And all the things, it, it's a, all those things um, that you learn there to share, to love each other, to uh, be fair. All these things are, um, are, are just so what um, the love of Jesus is about. So um, we complicate it and uh, mix it all up, and now it's turned into Babylon on us. Okay, so um, what can we say? Um, let's see here. Uh, Cheryl Benson. I see Cheryl Benson there today. Um, where are you from, Cheryl? Hey, um, I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Well, I'm originally from Kansas City, Missouri, but um, I've now, been in I Chicago ask, for 15 what, years. What side of Chicago you all? South side. I, uh, right. I belong to um, Pastor Jonathan Brooks Church, Canaan Community oh. Church, um, who is who is going to preach at Lindale, who's going to be at Lindale. Yep. Um, so um, I have really enjoyed this today. I've 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 been on before, but I haven't been on in a long time. But this has been just life-giving and um I, I learned so much today from just what i heard uh i so appreciate this ministry i've um done some work with ccda and i just love dr perkins and your family and and the work that you do so um you know i'm listening and learning that's that's what it's all about cheryl and uh, and jp will be speaking at lawndale this sunday Right, JP? We're taking it tomorrow. So, um, looking forward to that. I'll um, pray. Let's see. I'm, I'm just going to pick somebody. Dan Bradford. How's the weather out there at the beach? I'm, I'm always jealous. <laughs> All right, you guys. I just got off the beach. I'm heading into the office, but I'm so glad to be here. Wow, what a rich and amazing time. I, I'm... Uh, I, I do want to say, you know, and I posted in there that I think sometimes we forget that we're all a little wrong, but oh, we yeah. belong to the one who's right. And I think that there's some really, some real power there. I think one of the most profound things I ever experienced in the life of our friendship was Dr. Perkins one morning, we're in Jackson, he comes to Bible study and he puts his Bible on the table and, he's, and he just laments and he begins to lament over his sin. And I thought, uh-oh. What's going on here? And what he really did was he just was a, um, so humble about his humanity before the, the glory of God. And I, and I mean, I feel like I learned a lifelong lesson there that, 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 that humility um, is really the key to uh, enjoying this great love that God has offered to us. And, I, and I'm just astounded that, that, that Christians will grab a hold of an opportunity to, um, to correct everybody uh, and, and assign God's love to them. Whereas, you know, I think God loves us not because he agrees with us. We're all sinners, um, but he's invited us to agree with, to agree with his great love. And um, yeah, I mean, I think there's hope because there's a church on the ground empowered by the spirit of God, directed by the word of God, but man, it's a mess. And I, you know, I need this time with you guys and thank you for, you know, allowing me to chime in. Love you guys. Well, we love you too, Dan. Thank you so much. And we need to lean into the fact that we are broken and we're all equally broken. So um, uh, for us to feel superior to someone and be so broken, um, that is, that doesn't make any sense. So um Let's see, uh, Karen Farrar Perkins, how are you doing this morning up there in California? You're at, you're at school, right? Yep, I'm at work. So um, I, um, this message is, I think like Curtis said, there's a lot to digest. Mm -hmm. 
and um, really been thinking about that that love piece because that that word love it's like Christian. You know, the word Christian has been used and overused and overused, and love has been overused, and it's like how do we get back to that essence? Like I tell people, I'm a follower of Christ because Christian has been maligned and so has love. Like, so what, what does that actually mean today? Um, and so I'm learning that and I want it to be practical uh, as much as possible. And um and part of that love, I think I said that last week, is like learning to shut up. And listen. Do. Listen, do, listen, pray, listen, shut up, listen, love, shut up. Right. Yeah. That's one thing that, that Ray talked about was that we need to listen carefully, answer respectfully, and um and and, and be helpful to others. Um it was somebody that I was just looking at, but my screen keeps changing. Oh, Andy, Andy Gray, uh, would you would you share with us? You know, uh, you've been a pastor for so long. How um, you give us an example of how you reflect Christ out to others who may not agree with us, but or you may not agree with, but you want to um, walk in the love of Jesus Christ. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, I think. Uh, you said something just a little bit ago, uh, broken. I'm just uh, reflecting. Uh, there's a gentleman, Pastor Joe Sutton. He was on one of our civil rights pilgrimage with us, the first one when all those pastors came down from Minneapolis. Uh, he pastored a small church for many years, but I, I would say he was a mega church pastor. Like his, his church, probably not over 40 people, but his impact on the whole city is fascinating and whenever i was with joe uh, i feel like he he mentored me in this by demonstrating it i always felt that we were broken together and in fact a few years ago our our churches did a uh, mlk service together and that was the theme of the whole thing broken but together and uh, so as, as i've tried to influence people that disagree i think a piece of it is not demanding their alignment with me in everything and uh, humility to acknowledge, you know, that's a fair point. Huh. I think you're right about that. I disagree with you on this. And it, it, I think it opens the door for influence rather than uh, adhering so hard to something that I might be passionately convinced of um, when I make no room for they can't be right about anything or uh, I insist that they are in 100% alignment, then I would say it kind of falls into this thing of a, a, a rule by activist. Whatever I'm most passionate about, I become the activist. And if you don't align with me, then you're dismissed and you're wrong. And uh, so I think it's really important to um, as, as leaders, as influencers, we're all leaders in different ways, uh, to make room for disagreement, but still kind of holding on what he said, that somebody's, they know they're well loved, even though I might well disagree with them <laughs> right now. But how do we disagree well? Uh, that's, a, that's a really, I think it's a matter of uh, spiritual maturity, actually. There's a confidence yeah. in Christ. My identity is secure. So whether I persuade you this way or not, uh, I, I'm solid with Jesus. We're good. And I can still love you and pour out. But um, but I don't, I don't have to have your agreement to make me whole. Amen. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Andy. And um, we're going to continue this conversation um, next week on, on how to have unity within the body. And uh, Gary Vander Ark, he'll be back um, with us and sharing on that. And um, we're going to close in a word of prayer and thank God for, for this time. And um, we want you to continue to uh, reflect on yourself and how God can um, reflect out from you. Um, Frank, would you close us in prayer, please?
Uh, thank you, dear Heavenly Father, uh, for another day, uh, another fresh start, another opportunity. Lord, we uh, just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be on this Zoom call weekly, um, to just fellowship and connect with other believers. Um, we are very, very grateful for that, Lord. We want to lift up in prayer the water crisis in Texas, um, that it will continue to keep uh, striding forward and getting better, dear Heavenly Father. Um, I come in agreement with any prayers that have been uh, prayed this morning. We all do. Um, hear our hearts, soften our hearts towards what you're trying to do in us and the new things that you're trying to uh, make anew in us, in our minds, in our spirits, Lord, and teach us how to operate through love and freedom. Um, help us understand what that means and then to operate from that place. In your name we pray. Amen. Yes. Thank you so much, you guys. We'll see you next week. Continue to love one another and especially those in your own home. All right, thank we'll talk to you next week. Bye, guys. How is Doug doing? Thank you, thank you, guys. He is doing good. Who, who said that? We've been praying. We've been praying for him. Great. Oh, Great. He was so on much. today. It was so good yeah. to see you. We noticed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for everything. Bye.